Well, there are so many different kinds of power in the world. There is the power that certain leaders have over us. There is the power that certain family members may have over us. There is the power that certain memories or moments may have over us. There is the power that certain ideas may have over us. There is the power that certain wants or needs or desires or ambitions may have over us. There is all kind of power and powers at work and play in the world. There is emotional power. There is mental power, there is economic power, there is political power, there is spiritual power, and yes, there is even physical power. And from time to time, there are innovations in our world in how we access and relate to the various kinds of power. About five or 6,000 years ago, a discovery was made that changed the course of human history as we know it, as we began to figure out how to harness a new kind of power. This is the time period when archaeologists believe some humans figured out how to tame and to mount and to ride and to maneuver a horse. And before that, even, people had figured out how to harness horses for pulling wagons or plowing fields. And the power that that infused in human society, literally, the horsepower, was transformational. For transportation and for moving things over long distances, for work and for war and for so many other things in this world. And even though we still use horses today and still appreciate horses today though, we also know that the world has changed because of the discovery and the harnessing of other kinds of power. It was actually the marketers of the steam engine who began to coin the term horsepower as a way to market the way the steam engine could multiply this power and dramatically change the life of our planet as we travel and trade and as development continue to expand in human history. And though we still do utilize trains, their engines have changed, and human history is also changed by new kinds of engines, electric and gas and diesel, that can help us move in more versatile and even individual ways than locomotive steam engines can. Most of us can't imagine our lives without these discoveries, without harnessing these new kinds of power. We take these kinds of power and our access to it for granted, even though when you look at the larger arc of human history, we really haven't had much of any of it for a very long time. And yet we, we value, we are grateful for this kind of power and these innovations and evolutions in power. Well, in Ephesians 1, Paul is talking about another kind of power that we also sometimes take for granted, just as he names an evolution and how humans can use and access that power. This power and its harnessing is the source, actually, of more innovation and more achievement and more impact in the world and upon creation than most of us are even aware. Some of us take it for granted. Some of us are actually somewhat ignorant of it. And I'm afraid a lot of us actually choose to reject it in the sense that we really don't want it. At least not at the expense of other things that still have power over us. We're like the wealthy and powerful young man that Jesus talked about who, like so many of us, have so many things in this life that make us comfortable and so many things as we want them to be. And and like us, he saw something out there. He recognized a new kind of goodness, a new kind of power that seemed to make life better for those who were accessing it. He discovered it and he wanted it. And so he went to Jesus and he asked him, what must I do to inherit that kind of life and to embrace that kind of power in it? And when Jesus told him he had to leave behind things that had power over him first, he simply walked away. 
He glimpsed the power of eternal life, and he wanted it. He glimpsed the power of Jesus in the people that followed him, and he wanted it. He glimpsed the power of the gospel as God began to unleash it into the world, and he wanted it to be unleashed in his life. He wanted that power, but just not that badly. I wonder how many of you want it, but just not that badly. How many of you would like more of the power of God in your life? How many of you here would like to experience and access more of God's power in your life, just not that badly? You can have all of it, Jesus says. I want you to have all of it, Jesus says. I came so that you might have all of it, Jesus says. And you want it, theoretically, But when Jesus asks you if you're willing to give up the power that that other thing in your life has over you in order to embrace Christ's power at work within you, you say, well, actually, we often say nothing. Like the rich young ruler, we often drop our heads and once again walk away. We go back to our stuff. Whatever it is, we don't want to lose that still has power over us. How many of you have done that at some point in your life? How many of you have glimpsed the power of God at work in others? You've seen it, you've noticed it, you've wanted it, but ultimately, not that badly. How many of you have more than glimpsed it? How many of you have experienced it? How many of you at some point have accessed it, have harnessed the power of Jesus in your life, but then at another point you walked away from it and went back to the things that used to have power over you? The very things that the power of God had previously freed you from. Now you probably wouldn't sell all of your vehicles right now and start using a horse and cart for travel. You probably wouldn't choose to swear off using anything other than the power of your own feet to get you to work or to school or to church or to get you to that vacation spot you've been longing to experience. You probably wouldn't leave any new and better power that you've learned to harness in order to go back to give yourself to some other kind of power, some lesser kind of power in those areas of your life. And yet when it comes to Jesus' power, when it comes to gospel power, when it comes to the power of God at work within you and through you, well, often that stays negotiable. Probably because we often perceive it as less powerful than it actually is. And Paul doesn't want us to do that. Paul doesn't want us or these Ephesians to do that. He wants them to understand and us to understand what kind of power we've been given access to. And so he does hear what we often need done for us. He reminds them of the power of the gospel by pointing them once again to what they say they know and what they say they believe God's power has done and can do in their lives. Paul writes in chapter 1 verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, church, in order that you may know the hope to which God has called you the riches of God's glorious inheritance for God's holy people, and God's incomparably great power for us who believe. And that power, Paul says, now listen to this, that power is the same power that God exerted when God raised Christ from the dead and seated Christ at God's right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. Now, I know most of us 
have cycled through enough worship services and enough Sunday school classes and enough Easter Sunday celebrations to take for granted that we know exactly the kind of power Paul is referencing here. But you should know that whatever you think you know about resurrection power, you don't know enough. And I don't know enough. Because it's more. It's more than we think, and it's more than we know, and it's more than we even remember, and it's certainly more than most of us will ever truly learn to access. The early Christians believed in and experienced the power of resurrection in their lives, and it changed their lives dramatically and drastically. Jesus' friends, the same ones who had been learning from him and walking with him and, and, and serving with him for three years, were found in fear, locked behind closed doors, and yet when they found out what had happened, they were almost instantly transformed. They began living their lives with confidence and conviction that changed their lives and the world for Christ. Because they witnessed the living Christ in bodily form, raised from the dead, walking around and talking around three days later after he had been brutally crucified. Now what kind of power would it take to do that? What kind of power would it take to do that and even more? The early Christians believed that God's resurrection power could do even more. The early Christians believed that the resurrection power of God is the power of God for our salvation. That through it, our sins are forgiven and that we are reconciled once again with God. And that is huge in and of itself. Early Christians believed that resurrection power did that, and they believed it did even more. What most of the early Christians believed, and we see this even later in this letter, is that there is more going around us, going on around us, than we can see with our eyes and hear with our ears. That there is the realm that we can see and easily access, and that there is another heavenly realm, as Paul calls it. That's why Paul later says in Ephesians chapter 6 that we should put on the full armor of God. And he's beginning to talk about spiritual power and spiritual conflict. There is a spiritual realm and there are spiritual beings among us. Some of those beings are in love with God and are choosing to serve God. And some of those beings are living in rebellion against God. Now you may not believe all of that, but you need to know that Jesus did. And the early Christians did. They believed that there were principalities and powers in the world that ruled over us, that influenced the world, that have power over us, powers of deception and destruction and death. And one of the chief things early Christians believed happened between Good Friday and Easter Sunday is that Jesus stormed the gates of hell set the captives free, overpowered the powers of darkness, and achieved a kind of victory in creation that was new and transformational and ultimately comes into the world through us as we embrace and access that power, as we harness it and learn to maneuver and navigate it in our own lives. What power? The same power that raised Jesus from the dead. What power? The same power that overpowered the powers of sin and death and the devil. What power? The greatest power in all of creation. The power that actually fueled creation. The power that actually fuels resurrection and the power that fuels abundant and everlasting life. It's the same power, Paul says. So then why do we hesitate to do all we can to cultivate this power and its work in our lives? And why do we sometimes walk away from it and turn back to other powers just as we're beginning to get a small sniff of how powerful life in Christ can actually be? I think it's often because Christ's power is a power that doesn't look that powerful 
to us. It's not a power that overthrows governments or political movements, but it is a power that overthrows the evil and the entanglements in our own hearts. It's not a power that makes us conquering heroes in the way our world expects us to become conquering heroes, but it is a power that manifests itself powerfully in kindness, in compassion, in long-suffering, in deep and abiding hope and peace and joy, even when joy doesn't make sense. In Philippians 4.13 Paul writes that he has learned the secret of being content in all circumstances and proclaims that he can do all things through Christ who gives him strength. Now what kind of strength? The same kind of strength he proclaims a chapter earlier in Philippians chapter 2 when he says exactly what he's referencing here in Ephesians chapter 1. God exerted this strength and exalted Jesus to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And what does this resurrecting and exalting power look like in our lives? Well, Paul says in Philippians 4, it looks like having the power to be content in all circumstances, in the face, in any and everything that the world might throw at you, writing, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Is there a person or an event or an experience or a fear or a possession or a pleasure in your life that has an unhealthy amount of power over you right now? Would you like to experience the power of God in and over that thing? Would you like to see what it's like to have the same power that raised Jesus from the dead manifest itself in that moment, in that situation, in that relationship, setting you free as it grows in you and through you? And if so, are you willing to do what it takes to discover and to harness the depths of that power? Are you willing to truly follow Jesus into a new and spirit-filled and spirit-fueled life. Are you? And if you are, what are you willing to do exactly to make space for the power of God to grow within you? What are you willing to do? What are you willing to release? Jesus told another story in the Gospels that we sometimes call the pearl of great price. In it, he talks about a man who was in someone else's field and discovered a great treasure, and once he realized the value of that great treasure, he went and sold everything he actually had so that he could afford to buy that field and excavate that treasure from it and make it part of his life. Friends, that treasure is Jesus. So what are you willing to do? What are you willing to give up and take on so that you might be able to excavate all that Jesus actually has for you? So that you might learn to harness his power and so that you might live the life that God raised Christ to give you? What are you willing to do? Paul would say, I think, whatever it is, it's more than worth it. Amen.